So welcome everybody. My name is Dr. Anahid Ebrahimi and I work in the Office of Programs to Enhance Neuroscience Workforce Diversity within the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. We're pleased to welcome you to our Diversity F31 open house. Uh, before we get started, I just have a few housekeeping items. So this meeting will be basically kind of two halves, a presentation, uh, which will be recorded, and uh, then we'll go into basically breakout rooms where you get, you'll get to meet with our NIH staff and get your questions answered. Uh, so please kind of save most of your questions for uh, the breakout rooms. During the presentation, all attendees will be muted, and we will record and transcribe this presentation uh, for you to watch later on our website. You can enable closed captions under live transcript at the bottom of your screen, and we'll send you an email following the meeting with all the slides, the recording, all the resources you could ask for. Uh, so look for that a little bit later this week. Quickly, the goals today are for you all to better understand the Diversity F31 Fellowship and what you need to put together a strong application. Um, you'll get to meet some of the NIH staff who are a resource to you as applicants. And of course, we want to encourage you to apply. And quickly, I want to introduce uh, to you our speakers today. You'll hear, hear from um, in the breakout rooms as well, uh, Dr. Jones London, Dr. Matthews, Dr. Kulshowski, Dr. Ulrich, Dr. Tenekun, and myself. With that, I will pass it to uh, Dr. Jones London to give us a background on NIH and NINDF. Thank you, Dr. Ibrahimi. Um, just so nice to have such an amazing crowd today. I feel like a flight attendant where I say, we know that in this time of Zoom, you have many Zoom webinar options. So we're really glad that you chose to spend this time with us. And hopefully, you know, we know we won't be able to cover everything in depth, but we really want to put some touchstones for you and create awareness about especially the diverse, diversity F31, but just a little bit about how NIH works in general. So next slide. So um, our little cheesy joke around NIH is once you've seen one NIH institute, you've seen one NIH institute. This is really helpful to keep in mind, especially for um, trainees that are sort of beginning your journey and relationship with NIH. It's important to know that when we say NIH, we're really talking about 27 institutes and centers. And each IC has its own very discreet and specific mission. It has its own budget. It has its even own ways that it uses activity codes like the Fs and the Ks. And really it has its own way of doing business. Today we'll go through the diversity F31, but just a little warning, there's gonna be a bias, especially as we talk about it from the NINDS side, but thankfully we have our, C our um, CSR SRO rep who will definitely give you the broad um, perspective of NIH in general. When it comes to the NINDS, our mission is to seek fundamental knowledge about the brain and nervous system and to use that knowledge to reduce the burden of neurological disease for all people. And we're talking clinical research, translational research, and importantly, basic research. Next slide. So I've talked a lot about these different specific 27 institutes and centers. That can seem very overwhelming in terms of if you have research, what does this belong to? And even the mission that I just gave you for NINDS, you could say, well, that sounds great, but I'm doing this. Is this NINDS or is this NIMH? Um, where does it fit? And the truth is some research areas are gonna be very specific and you'll know immediately, but a large majority, especially in the neuroscience space, you can have a couple of homes. Um, and what we always suggest to people is talk to the right program official. And when we say that, we usually get a stare back in terms of, well, how did I do that? I've never done this before. That sounds easy enough, but how do I do that? And one way you can do that is by hopefully, now you'll make a few friends on this webinar you'll reach out to us, you'll contact us, and we can help and guide you to the right person. The other way that you can think about this in terms of finding the right program officer is that if you're doing research, 
that is a sort of a expansion of scope from your mentor, their PO will most likely be your PO, or at least at the same institute. Um, that's not always the case, because sometimes maybe you're branching off a little bit broader. Um, another way to find this is sort of the matchmaker of science, which we actually call a matchmaker. And this is a function in NIH Reporter. There, if you have a set of specific aims, they don't at all have to be polished. AI does not care. But a set of words, an abstract, maybe in a poster language that you have, you can put that in there. And what NIH Reporter will give you is some likely matches. And I say likely because it's not perfect, right? But it is a starting point for you to know. The other way is if you look at what we're now, we used to call funding opportunity announcements. We now call them NOFOs, um, our notices of funding opportunities. And there you'll also see a table of IC contacts. So as you're starting off on the journey, that's the first step really. Besides talking to your mentor and those around you at your institution to guide you, but when you're thinking about, and you should be thinking about interacting and developing that relationship with the NIH, you're gonna to wanna to talk to your program officer. And this slide just really gives you some steps to do so. Next slide. Next. All right, so the program officer, and then I've also talked about the NINDS open team where I'm the chief of the office and, and work with these wonderful people that you'll get to know um, even more um, in the breakouts. And then also uh, we have a colleague representing our training office um, here as well, who we work in careful partnership with all of our training programs. And the goal of our office really is, you know, as OPEN says, we are really here to open access and opportunities for all and especially underrepresented groups in the neuroscientists. And we do that by really thinking carefully and creating a pathway of programs across career stages. Next slide. So here, it can seem overwhelming yet again, but this is good news, right? Because if you look here, you see the career stages starting on, you know, from the beginning of high school all the way to new faculty really proud to work at an institute that has really carefully designed um, career training opportunities, professional development to hopefully support you in your career advancement. Um, there are programs like diversity supplements where additional money can be added to a research lab um, to mentor and train you so that can bridge you to your own individual award. And I know that we have some um, talented diversity supplementees in the audience now. And also a couple of other programs that as you go along in your career stages can support you in your transition across um, multiple career stages, such as the D-SPAN, which goes from pre-doc to post-doc, and the K-99 that goes from post-doc to faculty. But today we'll really focus on one mechanism, and that's going to be the diversity F31. But be encouraged if for some reason, as you hear a little bit about the diverse uh, um, diversity F31 and it's not a fit, you can remember that you have this whole pathway of programs that maybe you can find another um, program that is the right fit for you. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Ibrahimi. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jones-Lennon. All right, so um, I'll just get started again with a broad overview of diversity F31. If you don't know, across NIH and NINDS, we have NRSAs, the National Research Service Award. Um, this particular mechanism allows promising pre-doc candidates from groups that have been shown to be underrepresented in STEM to have their own individual research ideas supported. So the intent of this program is to increase the number of scientists from underrepresented populations in biomedical research and to help promote supportive and effective mentoring for those trainees. Now, probably the most important part, you don't want to invest time in writing an application that does not actually match the NIH policy or eligibility requirements and therefore, you know, end up being withdrawn and, you know, having all that time wasted. To apply, you do have to be a US citizen or permanent resident. Current appointees on T32s are eligible um, to apply, but you can't hold both at the same time. So if you are awarded the F31, your T32 appointment must end. 
For the diversity F31, individuals of one of the recognized NIH diversity groups based on underrepresentation on a national basis for this career stage are encouraged to apply. Um, soon you'll see in the chat kind of that notice of uh, interest in diversity from NIH. So please do read that very carefully. You can either be eligible based on um, race, ethnicity, individuals with a disability, or individuals from a disadvantaged background. Um, and again, kind of your, we don't decide that as NIH. Um, your application will have to include a letter from your institution explaining how you as the candidate, um, your participation will further the goals of this program to promote diversity. So please work with your mentor and your grants office to get this letter. And then again, very carefully read that notice of NIH's interest in diversity that was placed in the chat. Um, applicants must be enrolled in a PhD or equivalent research degree program, a formally combined MD PhD program or other combined professional or clinical and research doctoral degree. Um, and you can only be supported within the first six years of graduate school. And you must have a minimum 12 months remaining by the award start date. Um, so again, if you have specific questions about your eligibility, please ask Dr. Dr. Matthews or myself in the breakout rooms or email us. And then in terms of uh, the actual award details, the duration of support will depend on your year in graduate school, um, whether your second year or fourth year, and how much NRSA support um, you've already had, maybe through a T32. Um, the award budget can include the following, a stipend, tuition and fees, and then in institutional allowance um, to help defray the costs of fellowship expenses, such as health insurance, research supplies, equipment, books, um, travel to scientific meetings, these sorts of things. So you will work with your institution's sponsor grants office or budget office to complete this request. So you're not alone. Don't feel overwhelmed that you have to fill out this budget section by yourself. And then probably the most popular question we get asked is, um, how do you decide between whether to apply for the diversity or general F31? Um, to clarify, an INDS does support both the general F31 and the diversity F31. If you feel you don't fit the eligibility criteria for the diversity F31, you can consider the general. Um, very important to know that, that at NINDS, the diversity F31 funding rates are similar to the general F31. Um, in the notice of funding opportunity, the differences are mostly based on kind of career stage of the applicant. So for the general F31, applicants must be candidates for the PhD degree and have uh, identified a dissertation research project and sponsor. For the diversity F31, applicants may apply at any time. Um, applications are encouraged, though, uh, once an applicant has identified a identified a specific research project that will be undertaken in the sponsor's laboratory. Um, this often occurs in the second year of a PhD program. Uh, but very important, you cannot send the same grant to both programs and you cannot apply for both at the same time. Ultimately, you and your mentor, we might say sponsor or co-sponsor, but, but these are your mentor, your, your research PI, these are similar words you and your mentor must determine which funding mechanism is best or most appropriate for you. So with that, I'll pass it to Dr. Matthews to discuss kind of putting together your strongest application. Thank you, Dr. Brahimi. All right, next slide, please. All right, so if you've never applied for the Diversity F31 or you've never applied for a grant, um, it's important to stop and think about what you're about to do. Um, before you even start the application process, I think it's an important opportunity for you to really think about what you want out of this opportunity. Um, my suggestion is to approach this as an opportunity to get more than just funding for your graduate career. It's an opportunity for you to think very strategically and intentionally about what you want out of your research training you get to put together a timeline of career development and how you're going to progress while you're completing your doctoral degree. Um, and this allows you to have a more focused engagement with your mentor because these, all of these things you should be considering along with your research mentor or mentors 
and where you want to go and what you would like to get of this opportunity. Um, again, I will stress, you should not be alone in this process. While it is an individual award for your graduate training, this is something that you should be constantly discussing with your mentors, also some of your peers, and perhaps other trusted people within your program who can help guide you in thinking about what it is that you might need or you haven't yet thought of for your application. Next slide, please. So I think there's there are four important steps that you should be considering as you're preparing an application. The first step is to define your career goals and research interests. Um, and just getting the heck up out of your PhD program is probably not enough to, to withstand sort of some of these more deep questions that you can ask in terms of stating what your goal is, what your research question or question, what your research question is or research questions are. And at the end of the award, what will you be able to do? What do you plan on accomplishing from the time that you start the research proposal and the training plan to the time that you're done? And for the second step, it's really important that you perform a gap analysis. And so a lot of times we talk about our strengths and weaknesses. Well, you never got a PhD before, so it's not always a weakness. It's just a gap in your knowledge, a gap in your skill set, or perhaps something that you haven't yet experienced. And so when you think about all of the skills, all of the knowledge, all of the tools that you need to to do the very specific proposal that you're um, that is that you're going to be proposing in this application, it's important to think of the end goal and what you need to get there. So working a little bit backwards, this is what I say I want to accomplish, and here are all the things that I'm going to do to do it. Perhaps it's enhancing skills you already have. It might be gaining new skills, having an opportunity to learn more, um, whether that is specific technical skills you're using in the lab or communication skills to be able to talk about and share your research findings with others, and perhaps it could be leadership skills. So for step three, it's also really important that you focus on how you're going to build your career and training plan to your specific needs. If you need extra help in one area, but perhaps you notice your other classmates or folks in your lab may already have those skills, that's okay. You can't base your training off of what someone else needs. You should really think inward. And this is where it helps to have honest conversations with your mentors and even sometimes your peers. And they can help identify, yes, this is you're really strong in this area, but I think you could also use a little bit more attention in these areas. So be sure to seek guidance and mentorship when you're thinking about what your formalized career and training plan will be. And lastly, in step four, um, cannot stress this enough, be sure to read the instructions, know what it is that you need to have as a component of the application and follow what you're being asked to do. Um, but you also need to, to recognize that in order to do that, it's going to take both just reading the instructions and saying, how am I adhering to these? Be consistent, be realistic. Yes, it'd be nice to have this really fantastic project that you dreamed of for the last several months while working in the lab, but is that something that you're capable of doing in the time that you have allotted? Um, and also be very explicit about what it is that you plan on doing, but make sure that it is contained within the boundaries of the application and ask for feedback for people to make sure that you are indeed following those instructions. Next slide, please. So if you don't already know, there are certain applications that you must have in your F31, a biosketch. It's a little similar to a CV or a curriculum vitae, but it's very specific. The NIH requires that you use their template. And so be sure to look at the fellowship template that is offered on the NIH website and fill it out to the best of your ability. If you're not sure what should go in a specific section, be sure to ask for help. You will also have to talk about um, with sort of contained um, within the application is your background and your goals for the fellowship. And this is again, where you'll be very explicit about what you're hoping to get out of this, both in terms of your doctoral dissertation and research experience. So the research proposal, what your training goals and objectives are and how you plan to do that. And then of any other activities that are planned under the award. And so that will all be included in this section. And then lastly is the research training plan, um, which goes more specifically into the, um, the research that you're proposing. 
Again, if you have any questions about any of these components, I encourage you to talk to a mentor, ask a program officer, and also it may help you to see how someone else wrote their application so you can get an idea of how you want to tailor yours. This is not to copy what someone else has done, but simply to get an idea of the types of information that were put into this, um, to these different sections. Next slide. Yes. Um, so there also will be a sponsor and potentially co-sponsor statement. More often than not, the sponsor will be your primary research mentor. And a co-sponsor may be a good idea if you are doing some really comp you're proposing perhaps some more complex techniques that are not readily available in your primary research mentor's lab, or perhaps you have a junior mentor. So your mentor has only trained maybe one other student or you're their first graduate student. And so a more senior co-sponsor may be useful. And so they will need to, to, um, to have statements written of how they're going to support you, making both in terms of like financially supporting the research that's being done, talking about their qualifications as a mentor and your qualifications as an applicant to carry out the proposed research. Reference letters are something that are different from letters of support, but we can certainly talk more about that in the breakout rooms. And also there will need to be a candidate, uh, a description of candidate contribution to program goals, which is um, what uh, Dr. Ibrahimi mentioned at the beginning, talking about your eligibility uh, for this particular type of award. So now I will turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Kolchewski, to talk about the scientific review process. Okay, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here to discuss um, the F31 applications. So I'm from CSR, which is Center for Scientific Review. I am a scientific review officer. Next slide. Thank you. So I just first wanna begin with giving you the CSR website. It's a great website. I encourage everyone to look at it before you submit an F31 application or any fellowship application for that matter. So you get a little bit, if you go to this website, you'll find out what about CSR, applicant resources, their study sections, rosters and meetings. So it has a wealth of information for um, applicants. Next slide, please. Um, so CSR, Center for Scientific Review, our mission is very straightforward. It is to ensure that all NIH grant applications receive fair, independent, expert, and timely scientific review, free from inappropriate influences so that NIH can fund the most promising research. And more information is provided here. Next slide. So the scientific review officer has four main duties. We're responsible for the scientific and technical review of applications. We review applications for their completeness and conformance with application requirements. We ensure fair and unbiased evaluation of the scientific and technical merit of the proposed research. And finally, we provide accurate summary statements of the review to aid funding recommendations made by the National Advisory Councils and the Institute Directors. Next slide, please. So this just gives you a general overview of the review process for fellowship applications. So before the meeting, a scientific review officer such as myself will assign three reviewers to your fellowship application. Reviewers will provide their scores and written critiques. So during the review meeting, about 70 to 90 um, um, total fellowship applications will be reviewed in a particular fellowship panel. Um, these include all fellowship mechanisms that includes the F31, the F31 diversity, F30 and F32. And about 50% of all these applications are discussed. So um, we're focusing on F31 diversity today, but Typically in a fellowship panel, you will have other um, fellowships discussed at the same time, but the review criteria is the same for all of these fellowships. For discussed applications, all panel members will participate in the discussion. And then after the meeting, the SRO will release the final summary statement and the scores to the applicants. Applicants should contact their program officers or their officials after reading their summary statement with any questions or concerns pertaining to the review of their application. Next slide. So application scoring, there are five review criteria that contributes to the overall impact score that you get. I will go over that in the next slide, but basically each review criteria gets a score of one through nine. So a high impact application is gonna be scored with a one or three. And that means there's a high value to benefit of the training to the applicant. A medium impact application is going to have a score between four and six. So there will be a moderate to high value of um, benefit to training for the applicant. 
And then a low impact um, scoring application is going to be between seven and nine. And that's low to moderate value benefit of the training to the applicant. Next slide, please. So the fellowship application review criteria, there are five. So it's important that you address each of these in your application and you do so thoroughly. Um, so the fellowship, the first review criteria is fellowship applicant. The second one is sponsors, collaborators, and your consultants. Third is the research training plan. Four is the training potential. And finally, five is the institutional environment and the commitment to training. Next slide, please. So I'm going to go through over, over these um, each of the review criteria very briefly. I encourage you to reach out to your program officer if you have any questions or concerns about each of these review criteria. Um, the applicant. So there are three basic questions that you should be addressing very thoroughly in your application. Number one is, are the applicant's academic record and research experience of high quality? Number two, does the applicant have the potential to develop into an independent and productive researcher? And three, does the applicant demonstrate a commitment to a research career in the future? So make sure those are addressed clearly in your, uh, under the applicant. Um, number two, the second review criteria is sponsors, collaborators, and consultants. Are the sponsors' research qualifications and track record of mentoring individuals at a similar stage appropriate for the applicant's need? Does the applicant's research interests match, match the sponsors? Do the sponsor or sponsors understand the applicant's training needs and show a commitment to assist in meeting these needs? And finally, is there adequate funding to support the applicant's proposed research and training for the duration of the research component of the fellowship? Next slide. The third review criteria is the research training plan. And this is kind of where the meat of your application is. Um, and it typically is the longest. So. Um, First question is, is the research project of high scientific quality and well integrated with the proposed training plan? Number two, is the proposed research project sufficiently distinct from the sponsor's funded research and consistent with the applicant's stage of research development? And finally, is the timeframe feasible to accomplish the proposed training? For training potential, you should address these three questions. Are the proposed research project and the training plan likely to provide the applicant with the requisite individualized and mentored experiences in order to obtain appropriate skills for a research career. Number two, does the, applicant, does the training plan take advantage of the applicant's strengths and address the gaps needed in their skills and document a clear need for and value of the proposed training? And finally, number three, under training potential, will the proposed training enhance the applicant's ability to develop into a productive researcher? Next slide, please. And finally, the last review criteria is the institutional commitment or the environment to training. So are the research facilities resources, this includes equipment, laboratory space, computers, subject populations, training opportunities, seminars, workshops, professional development opportunities, are these appropriate and adequate and are they available for the student or applicant? Is the institutional environment for the applicant's scientific development of high quality? And finally, is there appropriate institutional commitment to fostering the applicant's mentored training? And finally, there's additional review criteria. So as applicable for the pro proposed project, reviewers will evaluate the following additional items while determining the scientific and technical merit and in providing an overall impact score. But these will not get a separate score. So it can, these items can contribute to the overall impact, but they don't get an individual score. And that includes protection for human subjects, if it's applicable in your application, inclusion of women, minorities, and uh, individuals across the lifespan. Again, if that's applicable to your um, proposed research, vertebrate animals. So if you're using animals, you must include this section, biohazard, and finally resubmission. So this is if the application is being resubmitted. So uh, reviewers will look at your response to prior review. Next slide, please. So after the review, applicants should carefully read your summary statement, contact your program officer and be prepared to discuss any questions. So please look at the reviewer comments from your summary statement, look at the scores and your percentiles, funding prospects and resubmission and other options should all be addressed to your program officer. They are an excellent resource once the, um, you have your summary statement. Next slide, please. After the review meeting, please keep in mind your program officer can assist with any questions regarding the review of your fellowship. That includes scoring and funding. 
An SRO such as myself cannot answer specific questions after the review of your fellowship application once the review meeting has taken place. Next slide, please. So concerns about any bias or integrity concerning the review process. We um, have a particular individual in CSR, the Associate Director of Diversity and Workplace Development who addresses the concerns. Also in CSR, we have a, a review integrity officer. Um, you can always reach out to the scientific review officer as well, but we do take bias and integrity very seriously. Our reviewers are um, trained on this, and it's certainly something that's a focal point of the review process. Next slide, please. How you, you can stay abreast of policy changes. Again, I gave you the CSR website, but NIH in general has a wealth of information for applicants, so I encourage you to look at the NIH guide notice. Next slide, please. And finally, the NIH guide. So this announces NIH scientific initiatives, provides NIH policy and administrative information, as well as links and forms. And I encourage you to look at that as well. So with that, I conclude and I pass it next to Lauren. Hi, everyone. Um, so let's say you listen to all this webinar and you're like, ooh, maybe I'm a little too far along for that F31. So um, I'm going to talk to you, or Dr. Chenakun and I are going to talk to you about two um, other funding opportunities to consider. If you could give me the next slide. Um, so you saw this already. Um, and so I'm going to talk about the NIH Blueprint and Brain Initiative F99K00. Um, and then we're also going to talk to you about the NINDS F32. So next. So the F99K00 is a um, mechanism that will fund you for the last one to two years of graduate school and then four years of postdoctoral research. So it's very similar to the K99R00, which is the postdoc to junior faculty award, but it's sort of one career stage transition earlier. Um, and so you, when you apply, you have to have at least a year and a half left so that at time of award, you will have 12 months in the F99 phase and it will fund up to two years. So generally people are applying in their third, fourth, sometimes even fifth year if they've had some delays um, and know that they're gonna need that additional time. Note that this is not an NRSA. So all that information you had about sort of the timing limits and um, that apply to NRSAs do not apply to the D-SPAN. Um, if you've been on an F31, if you've been on a T32 and you're sort of maxed out on the NRSI time, you can still apply for the F99. You just can't hold them both at the same time. You can only have one fellowship at the same time um, or at a time. And so this mechanism is also uh, intended for individuals from diverse backgrounds. And you must be performing neuroscience research within the brain initiative, which is um, generally more um, basic science and tool development, or the NIH blueprint, which is a collection of several different institutes and centers across NIH. Um, you can see them on the slide here that all do neuroscience research. You have to be at a US domestic institution and be a US citizen, U.S. citizen or permanent resident by time of award. And these applications are accepted uh, twice a year, usually April and December. So the next receipt date will be this December. And now I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Chenikun from the Office of Training and Workforce Development to talk about the F32. Thank you very much, Dr. Ulrich. So the F32 is actually a postdoc award. So you do have to be a postdoc at the time of the award, but you can actually apply for it. You can start the application process and apply up to 12 months before joining your postdoc lab. So for many of you, that will be probably in the last year of graduate school. And then the eligibility window only goes up to 12 months after joining your postdoc lab. So it's a pretty narrow window in which you can apply for this mechanism. And the thinking for that is that we really wanted to encourage individuals to be proactive and have early conversations with their postdoc mentors and to really come up with new, bold, creative ideas rather than 
joining a postdoc lab and jumping onto an ongoing project that's already happening and just churning out data and then in a few years time thinking about your project right so it's really about having ownership and trying to promote ownership of your research direction at an earlier stage and so to try and facilitate these earlier submissions um, for the NINDS F32, we made it so that preliminary data is not required. So literally, we just need a really good research proposal. Obviously, it has to be well thought out, well reasoned, a good training plan, and so forth. But you do not need to submit preliminary, preliminary data for this grant. And so given these different unique aspects of the NINDS F32, it does not actually go to CSR. These grants are reviewed internally at an NINDS, uh, the NST2 study section, but we can still only support research that fits within the NINDS mission. So again, we encourage everyone to reach out, particularly to me, to send me a copy of your specific aim so we can just confirm before you apply for this that your research does fit within our mechanism and then uh, we can go from there. Um, the one other slight difference that I will point out is that you don't actually have to be at a US domestic institution for this award. We have funded awards in Canada and Sweden. Uh, you do have to be a US citizen though, um, and you do have to justify about why you would choose to do the research at these foreign institutions rather than a US domestic institution. But that's a quick overview of the F32. I'm happy to answer more questions in the breakout rooms and I'm not sure who else I'm, am I handing it back to Dr. Yeah. Ibrahim or Dr. Ulrich? Back okay. to me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Michael. Um, so just to, to wrap up this section of the webinar, we want to point out that we have many ways to stay in touch. Um, we have a listserv, we have a Twitter account, we have a podcast. Um, I'm the host with my uh, co-host co is Dr. Marguerite Matthews, and we're working on season four right now. And um, also feel free to email us with any questions. So with all that, um, we just info dumped at you. You got a lot of information. I'm sure you have a lot of questions. So we will have four um, breakout rooms. We'll have one for any sponsors or co-sponsors that may be on the webinar. We have one for answering questions specifically about the F31, one for questions about scientific review, and one for uh, the other mechanisms we just talked about, the F99K00 and the NINDS F32. So these rooms should be opening soon. And um, once they're open, you should be able to choose which breakout room you want to go to, go to um, with the little breakout room button once they're opened. Thank you so much, Dr. Ulrich. I'm going to stop the recording.